I'd like you to get out your, your notebooks, uh, your, your um, turn the bulletin over, whatever it is that you're writing on. Remember, we always take notes. We always write down what the Holy Spirit tells us because God wants to speak to every single person in this room, something specific for you in your life to apply from this message to your week. And, and I just that's an, a behavior, a habit, a, 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 a a characteristic of our congregation that we just want to embrace because it's, it literally is life transformational. And this morning I want to share with you a, a message that's not a part of a series, but it's something that's very strongly on my heart. It's something uh, God kind of uh, quickened to me as I was listening to some podcasts uh, while I was working out. And uh, uh, it was, it, 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 parts of this are, are from a man named Paul Doherty. If you remember Billy Joe Doherty, uh, it was his son who's now pastoring down in Victory Church in Tulsa. Some of it's from a message he heard, and some of it's just what the Holy Spirit put on my heart because it really embraced it. And the title of this message, though, is The Answer is in Our Hands. Can you repeat that to me? Say, my answer answer. to my issues issues. is in my hands. hands. Now, that that may seem like a strange thing to say in a a church service because we trust God for the answer to all of our issues. But I really think there's some things that God has put into our hands that are meant to be used to help address our issues. And I want to talk some more about that. Now, the foundation for this verse is found in Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. And I want to set the context for this. Jesus has gone into the northern part of Israel. Now, he's in northern Israel, north of the Sea of Galilee, towards the Golan Heights. And he's at a place called Caesarea Philippi. I see Doug and Linda back there. Good to see you guys. You were with us in Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi was a place of of religious worship because there was a cave there called the Gates of Hell. And if you would show the picture, this is the Gates of Hell. It's actually a very beautiful place. There's a lovely spring that comes out, and and they've created a a park there, and you can go and sit and pray and experience in God. But in Christ's day, there was a huge uh, religious complex for pagan worship. And so it was a place of power from a religious standpoint, from you know, religious power, but it was also a place of Roman power because it was, it was a Roman Caesarea, Caesar, it was a Roman settlement. So it's a place of religious authority and a place of political authority. And so Jesus has gone there and he's in the last six months of his life. And he's beginning to do a, a shift in his ministry. He's, there's something happening. For two and a half years, he's been talking about the kingdom of God. He's been praying for the sick. He's been multiplying loaves and bread. He's been demonstrating the kingdom on earth. But now he is going into a time of preparing his closest followers for what's going to happen after he dies. And so in the context of that understanding, read with me Matthew 16, 13 through 20. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say I am? Well, Simon Peter answered, he said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, again, he's changing Peter's name, on this rock, I will build my church in the gates of Hades. Remember where he's at. The gates of Hades, or hell, will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven And then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is an amazing incident of Peter getting an incredible revelation of God. I do think it's kind of symbolic of of humanity that the very next passage is where Jesus tells him to get thee behind me because you don't have the things of God. And I think sometimes we have to remember that sometimes we have these wonderful moments and other times we have these human moments. But but what, what is happening here is that Jesus, on the obvious level, is appointing Peter as the leader of the early church. He is. He's beginning to transition, so he's appointing Peter of the early, as, as head of, of the Christian church. There was only one Christian church for about 400 years, and then the first schism happened, and then at, from that point on, there was further schisms and further schisms. We're extremely divided now. Did you know there's 212 Baptist denominations in America? What? 212. I looked it up online, Pat. It was blew me away. I mean, if there's 212 different kinds of Baptists, how many different kinds of charismatics are there, are, are independents? I mean, there's an infinite number. But, but, it, but in this time, there was really only one church. And, and, and 
it, it is that obvious preparation of Peter to step into a role that he really wasn't ready for except by the power of the Holy Spirit. But it's also a, a, an issue that I want to focus, number one, on is that Jesus is giving us an assurance that the future of the church is good. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. There is no political power. There is no spiritual power. There is nothing that is going to stop the church from accomplishing the purpose that God has created for it. Seriously. Nothing. About 10 years ago, uh, there was an evangelist who asked if he could have a meeting with me in the old building, and, I, and he wanted to bring some people with him. And I said, sure. I, you know, I knew the man. I, I respected him. And he came to my office. We sat down. And he said, this is what I need you to do. We are in a time of crisis. The church is collapsing. There is decay across uh, all of the kingdom of God, and we must rally. We must react. And, and being an evangelist, he got very emotional and began to, to do all these things. And I just, I just let him talk. I let him talk for a while. And I said, well, can, can, I, can I talk now? He says, sure. I said, okay. Number one, I don't agree with your premise. And he says, what? He said, you say that the church of Jesus Christ is failing, and I am 180 degrees opposite of that. We see the church of Jesus Christ thriving in Asia. The underground church has exploded. Joe, you and I have been there multiple times. You know, it, it's gone from a, just a, a nugget or a kernel into this amazing tree of strength. We see revival breaking out in Africa and South America. Mexico is awash in revival, has been for 20 years. And you see revival beginning to happen in Europe and in the Muslim world, and even, dare I say, in Denver, Colorado. We are so excited to be one of the churches that we see sort of beginning to sense the stirring of the Spirit, you know, Bridgeway and the Rock and, and Cherry Hills community and others that, that are beginning to just begin to flow in, in unity, just praying for an outpouring of the presence of God and an awareness that, that the Lord is, 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 is doing something in our city. And all we say is, yes, God, more of it. But the promise we have is that no political or no spiritual force from hell is going to defeat the church of Jesus Christ. And so we need to take a chill pill and quit freaking out about whatever current political trends may make us nervous. Because in the end, God wins. God wins. That's an incredible promise. That is incredible. But that's not what my sermon's about today. <laughs> I just didn't want to go past that without pointing that out. What my sermon is about today is that Jesus is telling his Messiah, telling, excuse, Jesus the Messiah is telling us, the people who accept him as Messiah, people who accept him as son of the living God, people who accept him as our Savior and Lord, that we hold in our hands the keys to releasing or unlocking the kingdom of God in our lives. Literally, the answer is in our hands. If you have a set of keys in your pocket, would you take them out and just, just rattle them for me? Just take them out rattle them. You know, like that, just take them out and rattle them. Let's all rattle them. Everybody rattle them. You guys are sitting there. Some of you don't want to play. <laughs> Fooey on you. We like to play. You know what this is the sound of? This is the sound of victory. This is the sound of power being released. This is the sound of people beginning to embrace the reality that God has put something in our hands that enables us to bring heaven to earth, to be conduits of his blessing not only into our lives and into the lives of our immediate family, but into the lives of the community that is desperate for a touch from God. We hold in our hands the keys to the kingdom. And this is really a big deal. I mean, it's a huge deal. Maggie, it's an amazing deal. Sorry if I woke you. I, <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, in, in 2 Peter 1.3, you know, Peter is teaching. This is who Jesus is addressing this to. He says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Jesus has given us everything that we need to be a fully formed follower of Christ. To, to live in this dysfunctional, broken, crazy world and overcome its dysfunction, broken craziness. He, he, he's, he's given us everything to overcome the brokenness that is within us. And we're all broken in some ways. Some people love the Steelers. I really don't know what that's all about. I'm sorry. <laughs> you wore it. I'm sorry. It was an easy, go you know, go get the towel out, wave it, and I'll cheer you. You got the towel with you. Oh, there you go. All right. <laughs> 
I actually felt for you the other night. That was, oh, that was bad. Yeah, that's all right. That's, I don't, the Broncos may be just, yeah, it's, it's tough. So anyway, I don't want to go down that, that choo, shoot that rabbit right there. Anyway, so the point of it is, is we have this incredible ability to overcome not only our brokenness, but the brokenness is around us. And if, if I could say this, the key is unlocking the kingdom of heaven and bringing heaven into our earth. Let's talk about the kingdom of heaven. If the kingdom of heaven were a place, we would all move there, right? If I told you the kingdom of heaven was found in, in, in Guthrie, Oklahoma, we would all get U-Hauls, pack up, and we would relocate to Guthrie, Oklahoma. Does anybody besides me know where Guthrie, Oklahoma is? God bless you all. <laughs> you, you, know, you know, because that's what people do. When, when people hear about an abundance in a place, when they're in a place of famine, they pack up and go there. The Jews left the promised land because it was in famine. They went to Egypt. The Okies and the Arkies left the Great Dust Bowl and they traveled to California. 1950, the South literally relocated to the industrial Midwest because of the outpouring of jobs and the construction and then mining and all, and all the industries that, you know, automobile industry. And in the 1980s and 90s, they went from the North back to the South because it dried up and the jobs all moved South. People go where there is abundance. That's what people do. Been doing it for as long as there's been people, and they'll do it until Jesus returns. And again, if it was a place, we would go. But the kingdom of God is a place with such abundance that when you have a revelation of it, you can't help but feel a tug, a pull, a compulsion to come into that, 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 that thriving, blessed community. In the kingdom of God, you have access Access to who? Access to the head of state. Show up at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, knock on the door, and ask the Donald for an appointment. See how that goes for you. Seriously. Call up Queen Elizabeth and ask her out for tea. She's not going with you. I'll just help you right now. No way she's going with you. Heads of state do not meet with, with lowly, bald-headed, middle-aged men who they've never heard of. It doesn't happen. But we have access to the head of our state. We have access to an intimate relationship with the creator of the universe. We have access to somebody who can actually tell us why we are the way we are. He's the best counselor in the whole universe. We have access to someone who can tell, teach us how to overcome what we struggle with and to, to show us that true love looks very different than what many of us think it does. But we not only have access, we have freedom. We have freedom from all the stuff that, that, that hangs on us, the depression, the anxiety. Uh, you know, depression is an epidemic. Mental health is, a, is an epidemic. It, uh, there was a pastor uh, at Greg Laurie's church, 30-year-old uh, gentleman, took his life. Many of you know this story. He, he very publicly uh, shared his uh, trials and tribulations, and this is a, a subject that a lot of congregations are talking about, and it should be talked about. Uh, you can be a Christian and struggle with mental health. You can be a Christian and struggle with depression, with bipolar disorder, with anxiety issues. doesn't mean you've done something wrong. It just means that, that you're struggling. And in the midst of that brokenness, surely we have enough grace for mental health as well as we do knees and shoulders and, 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 and you know, uh, allergies. I mean, I, you know, I, I, it's interesting. We, we have a hard time talking about this. But what if we got up and said a call for everybody who's, who's struggled with suicidal thoughts this week? Would you all stand up so we can pray for you? Nobody's standing up, you know, it, it, because there is an embarrassment, and we need to get past that. But, but, but in the kingdom of God, there is a compassionate Lord who doesn't judge us for our brokenness, but addresses the, the lies that have convinced us that our life isn't worth living. Because that's what happens. We, we become convinced of a lie rather than the truth. And Christ comes in and says, no, I made you beautiful and wonderful, and it is my will for you to prosper and thrive and be in health even as your soul prospers. But I want your soul to prosper. So we have access. We have freedom. We have power. Power not to, to, to make ourselves feel better about ourselves, but power to help make the world a better place through us. If I told you you could make the world a better place by allowing the Holy Spirit to fall upon you, by, by learning to take the keys to the kingdom that God has placed within your hand and locking that, 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 that open door that he wants to create so that you can become a blessing to people, you can pray for them, see the Holy Spirit fall upon them, 
You can find the strength to, to, to do things for people you never thought you could do. It comes in big ways, dramatic ways, and it comes in little ways. I was honored to be able to go down. Rich, you were with me at the Purpose Fest yesterday, and I, I met a guy named Blizz at the Purpose Fest. And, and Blizz is a mentally ill homeless gentleman, and I sat down and you know, I just, hi, hi, I'm Reese, who are you? And he, he proceeded to go into about a 20-minute you know, psychotic rant. And, and in the middle of it, I'm thinking, God, why did I talk to this man? And, and yet the Holy Spirit said, listen to him, honor him, give him hope. Let him know that he's important. Let him know that he matters. Yes. And the way you do that is listening to him. So for the next 20 or 30 minutes, I sat there and listened to a, a homeless, psychotic man talk to me about the most confusing things, that, that you know, just rambling and going in, in circles. And, and I'm not bragging on myself because literally it was the Holy Spirit that allowed me. Did you meet Blizz, by the way? I, you didn't. But, but, but allowed me to, to be able to sit there. And I walked away feeling, God, thank you. Not, not for the fact that I gave up a half hour of my, my afternoon, but the fact that you let me bless somebody, and I know it was your spirit, because can I tell you something? Reese ain't that patient. Yeah. Reese has an attention span of about four nanoseconds. And, and, and for the Holy Spirit to give me that gift to be able to, to listen to Blizz on a Saturday afternoon down near Colfax, that's the power of God operating in us to be blessings. In the kingdom of God, as we unrelease access, we release freedom, we release power, and we release abundance. Jesus said in Matthew 6.33 that if you'll seek first the kingdom of God, all the things that the rest of the world spends all of their time chasing will be added unto you. In addition, though, you'll receive so much more. Which brings me to this thing, if the kingdom of God is not a place, how do we get there? If a U-Haul won't help us relocate... If we hold in our hands the keys to unlocking the kingdom for our lives, which of these keys works? And how do we turn them in the lock? It's an interesting question. Because I really would like to experience heaven on earth, wouldn't you? Anybody in the room want to experience heaven on earth? Anybody want to experience some breakthroughs and some victories and some overcoming? Anybody in the room tired of being tired? <laughs> Anybody in the room tired of habitual issues? Just, geez, God, not again? You, you, you just try going around the mountain one more time. Anybody tired of feeling like everybody else is prettier and handsomer and healthier and more loved than you are? Nobody? Okay, that's good. All right, so on these points, I mean, this is what it means when the kingdom comes in. We unlock the abundance of God, and heaven comes to earth. So I just want you to consider some, some ways that you can begin to, to open up the windows of heaven, unlock the kingdom of God in your life. The first of all, you really got to realize that he's given us, not him, the keys. Okay, Jesus didn't come down and say, I have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. If, if you need something, come ask me for it. Now, we are to worship Christ. He is our Lord. We are to bring our requests before him. But who holds the keys, Jesus or you? We do. We do. He's given us the keys. But if you don't know you have the keys, you never unlock the door. <laughs> can, I can I tell you a, a self-stupid story? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. More enthusiasm for that than normal. I... I uh, in the old building, you know, there was a time, and Pastor Wally was still the senior pastor, and, and we, we had, you know, a big building, there was all kinds of doors, and so we had created one master called the X key that opened all the doors in the building. Well, people used to have to carry these big rings of keys, and so, you know, we started giving out master keys, and pretty soon we had 72 master keys distributed to people. Well, well, things began to disappear, lo and behold. I mean, you know, like drum sets from the sanctuary and power tools from places. And, and, and we were having petty crime and doors were getting left open and, and it just wasn't working. So I issued an edict that there were no more master keys. There would be two. Wally could have one and I could have one. The rest of them had to carry a big ring like this around with them or go check it out. And so, so people were frustrated. They couldn't get into places. Yet, amazingly enough, the the losses stopped <laughs> because when you have 72 master keys, you really have open doors. That's, that's what you have. Well, Sarah didn't get a key. And so she used to like to come over to pray. And so, so I said, well, honey, you know, we have a one rule for all and your level is not important enough to, to warrant a, a master key. 
I said I was stupid, guys. I'm learning. I'm on a journey here with all of you. And so, so she would borrow my key. And so finally, you know, I realized that that was dumb. Actually, somebody came to me and said, you really ought to give your wife a master key because I just think that would be good. So I, I got a master key and I put it on a ring. And then I did something even stupider. I didn't tell her she had it. So she kept borrowing my keys for like weeks and weeks and weeks. And finally, I said, honey, why don't you just use your key? And she said, what key? The master key. You told me I couldn't have one. Oh, I got you one weeks ago. I put it on your key ring. Crickets. And you didn't tell me? Oh, whoopsie. (laughs) The point of it is, is you can have all the keys in the world. But if you don't know that you have them, you'll never put them to use. So I'm telling you this morning that you hold in your hands the keys to the kingdom, and that you have in your hand the solution to a lot of your problems. The issue is, are you going to put it to use? Well, how do I put it to use? Well, you begin to realize that we unlock the keys to the kingdom by exchanging old loyalties for new. When I tell you you're part of the kingdom of God, that that means that, that, that your first alliance cannot be to whatever kingdom that you're a citizen of. In our case, most of us are Americans. But it has to be to the kingdom of God. But loyalties are are more than just just political institutions. Loyalties are are attitudes of our heart. It's it's where we're looking for solutions. Uh, I've been reading 2 Chronicles, amongst some other things, really studying it uh, for the first time in depth, I think, in my whole life. And and you see this repetitive history of Israel where these kings would would, would just abandon God and and begin to worship other pagan gods. And they would begin to, to say, God, they would just exchange the loyalty of Israel, the loyalty of Jehovah, for other king gods, and then be shocked that, that, that it didn't work for him. The question in our heart is, is, I know we're not sacrificing to Baal. I hope you're not sacrificing to Baal. I haven't been to your house, though. I, 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 <laughs> there's no Asher poles in your backyard. But, but the point of this is, where is our confidence? Are we looking for the solution to our problems through natural or supernatural means? Are we looking for wisdom and the wisdom of men and the wisdom of the world? Or are we looking for wisdom that is eternal, that comes from the creator of the world? Where do our loyalties lie? Are we looking for for worship experiences that, that, that conform to the tradition that we've had all of our life? Or are we looking for worship experiences that that bring the presence of the kingdom into our current context? See, people need to have an encounter with God. Thirty years ago, Rebecca and with David Marlene in Kansas City, there was a young lady that came to one of our conferences and just had a powerful encounter with God and got powerfully set free from some things. And it was an amazing thing. And I got to meet with her later, and, and she came in. She said, I've never experienced anything like that in my whole life. I was raised in a, in a church. I believed in God, but we never saw the power of God. I never felt the love of God. I never felt so much acceptance and so much grace and so much forgiveness. I said, I'm so wonderful. Why don't you keep coming? And she said, oh, no, no, I could never leave my old church. <laughs> and I said, well, why don't you keep going to your old church and come to a different church? Or if you don't like our church, here's four, literally, here's three of our four others that are right near where you live that are great life-empowering congregations. And she said, oh, no, I've been this all my life. I can't change. And and all I could think of is, I'd change. I'd change tomorrow. Of course, I was an agnostic. I didn't have anything to leave. I I, I had no religious affiliations. But for some people, it was just so hard for her. I said, honey, you've got to leave old loyalties. If you want to keep going for a while, great. But go where there's life. If you want to unlock the kingdom, Because if your old wineskin could have unlocked the kingdom, you wouldn't have been brought to this place of a new wineskin. Thank you. (laughs) It's important. People come to me all the time and they say, I struggle with these issues whenever I hang out with these friends. What do you think I ought to do? Find new friends. It's not that you have to dislike people who you love. You shouldn't. You should love everybody. But, but, But there's some people that when you get around them, you do stupid Man, I don't need any help to do stupid. I, I, I need people to help me to do smart. And sometimes we've got to sever those old loyalties to unlock the keys to the kingdom. Sometimes we've got to exchange old beliefs for new. You know, Jesus teaching in Luke, this is a famous verse in the word faith movement, of Luke 11, 22 to 24. He says, have faith in God, he answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not, have you ever wanted to say that to a person, though? Go throw yourself into the... No, I, I don't. And does not doubt in their heart, but believes what they say will happen. It will be done for them. And therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe you have received it, and it will be yours. 
The question is, what do we believe is God's will for our life? Do we really believe God wants us to have a healthy marriage? Do we really believe God wants us to have a healthy mind? Do we really believe that God wants us to thrive and prosper so that we can be generous on all occasions? Do we really believe that heaven is supposed to come to earth through us? Not that we are given a place of dominance over people. God's not into dominating people. You know what our, our Savior did? He gave his life for people. He became the greatest servant in all the history of the world. Aren't we to emulate him, to become servants of one another? Shouldn't our church serve other churches? Seems like a thought. It has relevance to a further conversation later, but I think we should. And honestly, we should exchange old habits for new. If you don't pray, start praying. If you pray and you're not seeing the answers to your prayer, pray a different way. I started this about two months ago. This is my new prayer journal. I've got, I'm up to 46 prayer requests. 46 things that either have come from me or from people in the church who've walked up to me and it, please give it to me in writing if you want to make it, but, but I started praying over these, and I'm starting to you know, mark through all the prayers that get answered. Now, some of these you know, don't get answered you know, until we go with Christ, but some of these, man, it's, we're getting breakthroughs on these. We're seeing people get financial breakthroughs, healing breakthroughs, relationship breakthroughs. You, you, you need to begin to ask for in faith, but what are you believing for? We've got to change some of our behaviors. We've got to change what we read, how we have church. We've got to change our fellowship. Our relationship should draw us to Christ, not just football, although I love talking about football. We've got to change how we speak. Do we speak life over ourselves or do we speak death? Do we talk badly about ourselves? Or do we talk that I am the righteousness of God in Christ, not because of me, but because of him? Do we change how we live so that we can unlock the kingdom of God into our lives and release that abundance? As I bring this message to a close, and there is something else I need to do today before we depart, I just want to leave you with these two assignments. I believe God wants to work through us to bring the kingdom not only in our lives, but to the lives of other people. And I wrote this down as an action point. It seemed a bit intimidating, and then I decided you guys are up for it. I would, seriously, that I would like you to contact and encourage seven people this week. And I'd like you to start writing names down right now. You can do one a day. You can do seven on Monday. You can go home tonight and do all seven on Sunday. But find seven people that you know, that you believe the Holy Spirit is leading you to, that you can contact and encourage. Might be family members. My sister's going through another health challenge. I know she's going to be one of my seven. You know, I, I, it might be coworkers. It could be... You know, people that you knew from high school could be Facebook friends. One of the cool things about Facebook is it reintroduces you to all the people that you'd hope to forget, and they've all come back. And, and so it's, it also reintroduces you to people that, that you do want to connect with, people who are struggling. And, and uh, it's a good thing. A friend of mine uh, lost her father. He was my dad's CPA. I hadn't, hadn't thought of Bob Schleisman in years, and yet Joyce posted on Facebook about her father dying. And, and all I could think of is the times we had dinner together at his house, and I was probably seven, and Joyce was eight, and, and, and uh, her brother, uh, you know, we, we all played in their basement, and I just was able to reach out to her this week and encourage her. But that's the first thing, seven people. It's not too much. Really, seven people that God would put on your heart. Second one is a little bit different. I want you to practice listening to a person while listening to God. And I shared with you about Blizz, the guy downtown, but, but I say this because Friday I, I had another situation happen. There was a pastor that I'd gotten connected with who's just gone through a really difficult season. And I'd reached out to him, and he'd reached back, and we finally connected. And he was out in San Francisco, and he was driving in his car, and he said, hey, hey, I just I can't talk. Can, we, can I call you in 20 minutes when I get to a hotel? I said, get to a hotel, call me. So he calls me and says, hi, you don't know me? I said, I don't. And, and he said, well, let me just tell you my story. And he started to talk. And he talked for 35 minutes. He talked about his youth and his encounters with God. He talked about a time when he fell away. He talked about his, his early ministry times. He talked about being bivocational and prospering both in ministry and in business. 
He talked about the wondrous experiences that he'd had encountering God, you know, being able to, to record albums and as, preach messages and, and pastor a church from, from a small handful of 24 people in his living room to, to literally, you know, 1,500 to 2,000 people on a Sunday morning and just and sharing this amazing story and yet seeing it all sort of unfold as the enemy got in and as the enemy always does, he seeks to rob, to kill, and to destroy and, and to begin to just unravel everything that God had put together in his life life and finding himself in his mid-30s, you know, unemployed, out of ministry, you know, personally bankrupt, his, his family has left him, and then the journey of restoration in his life. And, and, and it's funny to, to listen to somebody who you've never met talk for 35 minutes. Again, I've had a weird anointing on, on me the last couple of three days. It's an anointing to listen. Can you believe that, Eliphaz? An anointing to listen. And, and uh, miracles happen. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, it's... And, and, and yet in this thing, as he was listening, all I could hear is the Holy Spirit tell me over and over again, just be silent and let him talk. And when he finally got to a place of, of just having poured himself out, I was able to pour some hope and life back into him. And I realized he's not looking to me for answers. He's looking at me to affirm the answers he's already had. So I just said, hey, isn't it so good what God has done? And I began to tell him a little bit, a couple of stories of people who I know have gone through similar things, and God has just blessed him. And I thought about that, and I said, well, God, maybe that's one of the keys to unlocking the kingdom of God in our life, is to actively listen to people without interrupting them, to give them free range to talk for 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes without trying to interject our thoughts, and then ask the Holy Spirit what it is you would have us to say back. Maybe that will really release the miraculous where you can say, let me pray for you. Let me believe for you. Let me share with you. Let me just hug you. Whatever it may be. So seven people and then one person that we actively listen to. You think we can do that? Let me just check the back row. You guys think we can do that? What about the back row back here? You guys okay? Insul, you can do that? How about the front row? We can do that? How about the middle section? You guys good with that all across? Okay, so let's just pray for that. Father, I just thank you that you do show us truth, and the truth sets us free. And I believe, God, that you've shown us that we do have the keys in our hands, and even given us a couple of steps, God, for how we can unleash, release that kingdom into our lives and into the lives of those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, I told you I had something else I wanted to share. This is not so much fun. This is, this is bittersweet. Um, about a month ago, I sensed the Holy Spirit telling me that there was a change coming to our, our, our ministry team. And if you're a pastor and you have a great team of people, when you hear something like that, your first reaction is to rebuke it as a lie from the pit of hell. And, and so that's what I did. I rebuked it as a lie from the pit of hell. I came, you know, came against the enemy and his ways because he's a crafty little slew foot dog, and I, I know he would try to sow discord. And yet, in the end, it really was the voice of the Spirit of God preparing me for something that is very difficult for me because it's, uh, I, I, love, I love this, this family more than you can know. They're, they're just an amazing blessing to our church, and yet God is doing something, and I love God more. And uh, Pastor Judah and Evie came to us and said they really felt like their time here at Encounter Church is coming to an end here in about a month. And uh, they have been approached by, by uh, Cherry Hills Community Church and been offered a job, which isn't the first time that you've been approached for a job. You've been offered multiple jobs in the three and a half years he's been with us. He's always said no, but this time he really asked to take time to pray about it, and he did. And he really feels like, and, and this is something that has been stirring in his heart for a number of months, that Judah has an anointing, a call, not just to this congregation, but to this community. And he told me this last fall. He said, Pastor, I really feel like God is calling me to a broader Denver context. And Cherry Hills is one of the churches, along with Bridgeway and The Rock and, and others, that, that we're in relationship with that, about this, this move of the Spirit of God, which is falling in our city. But what they have is a very unique situation. They, they're they're a, a, a large, large mega church. We're, we're a church of about 500 on a Sunday morning. They're a church of about 5,000. But they're a Presbyterian church, evangelical pres. And yet they're experiencing an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so the question then becomes, how do you shepherd an evangelical church into a charismatic you know, encounter? Furthermore, the pastor really feels like that he wants to host, you know, long, extended, far longer than I, will, I think I could even endure, uh, encounter services on, on specific nights of the week where they spend four, five, six, seven hours just seeking God. 
And they need people who really can do that, can do both, both help shepherd an evangelical church and also help steward people into, into heaven on earth experience. And, and as they are assembling a team of people, I can think of no one better qualified for that role than Judah Dawkins. Yeah. Nobody. I really can't. He is an amazing man of God, and he has a heart for people and to help people steward it. And, and so he felt it was the Lord, and, and after uh, a few days <laughs> of me really praying, I will tell you, my first reaction was like, well, that sucks. And uh, I, I'm sorry, that's really what I thought. And I, I, I literally went home, stayed up all night, and told God that, that he was a dirty dog. And, and, and uh, how dare he you know, bring us this amazing young man to help bless us and then take him away. I, just, I felt that was unfair, God, I'm just going to tell you. that. And, and God really got on my heart and said, don't you trust me? How did you meet Judah? I said, supernaturally. What, you got one miracle? That's it? I get one shot? I get one shot for a supernatural empowerment, and that's it? You don't have any other miracles you're willing to believe for? And I'm like, well, okay, I guess you could do something. And then several prophetic words came out of the conference, people who knew and people who didn't know about what was going on, uh, that, that God really has something amazing for Encounter Church. Furthermore, I really felt I got a breakthrough, because Marilyn and I were praying about this, and she said, you know, Reese, we, we need to see this as seeding Judah into the kingdom, specifically into Cherry Hills community. They need him. That, that is a church, his visibility. If I was his dad, I'd be ecstatic for this because he literally is going into a place of much higher visibility and he's going to reach people that we never could. We're a charismatic church. They're an evangelical church becoming a charismatic church. And so he is going to have an impact in lives that is totally different than what we've had. We should be totally stoked about what the kingdom is doing. We should be celebrating this. We should be excited about this. And when we're by ourselves, we can say it sucks. And, 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 and then we can, say, and we can say that we trust God. So I'd like to invite Judah. And I mean, they're going to be here for another month, and we're going to have a going away party. This is not the going away, but I just want to invite them up to the platform. Would you stand and honor this amazing couple for what God is doing? So, yes. Ah. Yeah. Hi, hi. Do you think maybe the Holy Spirit would give me a miraculous voice and I'll start leading worship? No, no, that's a general thing. So uh, do you want to say anything? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I love you, by the way, and you know that. Oh, yeah, that's the one thing is there's, <laughs> there's absolutely no, like, discord or anything. We, Reese and I, love each other so much. <laughs> Seriously, I've, I've been telling, <laughs> sorry, sweetie. <laughs> Um, push it down. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, honestly, I was telling somebody that, like, my relationship with this man, it, we've never been closer in our friendship than even in the last year. And we've just been growing closer and closer as friends. And it's just incredible. And, 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 and honestly, yeah. this is what I felt like. I can get up on stage and flow with him in the spirit. I don't even have to think about it. It's yeah. almost like we have the same... Maybe we do share a brain. I, and I don't know, but 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 there are spiritually. spiritually to be able to find somebody that you can flow with and feel comfortable with, and who you feel has your back, and also it has the same heart for what you want to do. Um, that that's yeah. a blessing, uh, an incredible blessing for a pastor. You all don't know what it's like to have a person like that on your team, because uh, it, it is. But I also know that that the same God who brought you to us yeah. can bring us that next guy. Yeah. And so. Uh, you know, there's going to be a party. The last Sunday is the 13th of October. 13th. Uh, please be in prayer for him. Honestly, he's stepping into a whole new situation. Uh, I'm, he's more than up for the task. I think he's going to thrive and prosper. He is not. He's, he's going to be one of the worship leaders they have. On, what is the name of the, new, the, the head worship leader there? Brandon, uh, Brandon yes. yes. He's a really cool guy. He's come and played here before. Uh, just a, a neat person. And it's a neat opportunity for unity. And, and be in faith. We, we're talking to people. But uh, I'd just like to ask... Uh, you know, if we could, just extend our hands. Again, we're going to be have an opportunity to bless them and think, but just extend your hands, if you would, to this couple. Step up, step up. I want to make you feel embarrassed and nervous and all those things. So, so Father, um, we are for this. We are for this. God, we are for this, because this is a kingdom thing. This is about uh, really, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it, it means that, God, that we're going to get this incredible blessing back into our, our church, back into our congregation. We believe, God, that, that when we sow big seed, we get big harvest. And this is a big seed. This is a big seed. This is an incredible seed. And, God, we are just so excited for what you're doing in Evie and, and Judah. 
And we know, God, that you're just taking them to, to new heights. I thank you, God, that uh, you're going to give him influence in this community, influence in the evangelical community, God, influence in streams of the church that he's never even uh, encountered before, God. It's a new experience for them. You're going to have a whole blessing on this team. They're bringing people from all over the country into Cherry Hills, and it's going to be a great uh, encounter moment. And I'm, I'm excited, God, for what it means for us. Uh, God, you spoke over us that, that uh, there were good things ahead, that you're moving us into times of connection and times of encounter here. Uh, I know that there's a woman or a man of God or a couple or whatever, God, that somewhere that, that are already being prepared to step into this role and to take us to, a, to an even higher place. Uh, they're going to be, you know, not hard as this is believed, they're going to be better than Judah and Evie. <laughs> so, so God, I just have faith for that. And we just honor and celebrate this man and woman of God. And we're just excited for them, Father, in Jesus' name. And let's just clap and celebrate what God is doing. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Love you guys. So much. All right. Amen. You're good people. Mm. Oh. Well, that's it. <laughs> and so love on them again. Probably the 13th or the week before, we'll do a party. We'll do a celebration. We'll do something. Okay? Yes. All right. Love you guys. Go with God. All right.